turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. As a psychotherapist turned author, Amy Morin's mission is to make the world a stronger place. Her education and expertise as a psychotherapist, combined with her personal experiences overcoming tragedy, give her a unique perspective on mental strength. In 2013, Amy introduced the world to the concept of mental strength when her article, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, became an anthem read by more than 50 million people. She's been dubbed the self-help guru of the moment by The Guardian and Forbes, refers to her as a thought leadership star. Her device has been featured by numerous media outlets including Time, Fast Company, Success, Business Insider, Oprah, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, and today she lectures across the globe to provide trainings, workshops, and keynote speeches that teach people how to build their mental muscle. Amy's also a lecturer at Northeastern University, columnist for Forbes and Psychology Today, with more than 6 million views in her TED Talk, making it one of the most popular talks of all time. Without further ado, I bring you Amy Morin. Amy, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Oh, good question. Um, I spend it uh, trying to, to make the world a better place. I do a lot of writing and speaking and talking about mental strength and uh, also spending time with people I love, my friends and my family. Absolutely beautiful. And, you know, Amy, before we get on any further, I'd love it if you could kind of tell my audience, paint the audience your story, because I, I listen to it and it's it's really mind blowing. And I think it has the capacity to help a lot of people. So if we could start with that, that'd be awesome. Sure. So I started in my career as a therapist and I graduated from grad school and I got a job as a therapist and I thought, okay, my goal in life is going to be to, to teach other people about mental strength and really didn't realize how much I was going to need mental strength myself in my own journey. But shortly after I started working as a therapist, my mother passed away suddenly from a brain aneurysm. And it was the first major loss in my life. And it was one of those moments where I realized, okay, it's uh, time to start using the same skills that I was teaching to other people and how do I apply them. And uh, it took a long time, of course, to to feel better, to create a new sense of normal in my life because my mother and I had been very close. And um, then on the three-year anniversary of when my mother passed away, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. And to be a 26-year-old widow was just a surreal experience and I uh, wasn't sure, what do I do? How do I, how do I move on from here? And it was a really dark place for a long time. It was painful. It was lonely. It was scary. And I had to, again, practice using all the skills that I'd learned as a therapist and put them into play in my own life. And at some point, I realized that having good habits isn't enough. Sometimes it only takes one or two bad habits in your life to really keep you stuck. So I started getting rid of bad habits in my life because I knew that from people I'd seen in my therapy office, sometimes it only just took one or two little things for them to to struggle to move forward after they've been going through something. And then um, it was years really before I felt like I got my feet back under me and before I felt like uh, I was moving forward, but eventually I did. And it was about four years later that I got remarried and I thought, oh, okay, this is my chance, my second chance in life. And uh, we'd moved, we bought a new house, I got a new job and I thought this is my fresh start. And shortly after that, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I thought, you know, why does this have to happen? Life is finally good again. Why do I have to go through something else? And this isn't fair. And in the midst of telling myself all of those things, I remembered that uh, feeling sorry for myself wasn't going to be helpful. 
And so I sat down and I wrote a list of all the things that mentally strong people don't do. And number one on the list was feel sorry for themselves. And I would read that list over and over to myself uh, over the next coming days because I thought, okay, I need to make sure that I'm not doing these things. I need to to be here um, as best I can for everybody around me. And I don't want to waste the last few weeks uh, that my father-in-law is on earth was just hosting a pity party. And at some point I thought, you know, if this list is helpful to me, maybe it would help somebody else. And so I published it online and thought maybe a few people would read it. Never imagined that it would go viral, but it was read 50 million times. And so shortly after it went online, before I knew it, it was picked up by lots of different publications like uh, Forbes magazine picked it up and it became their most viral article of all time. It was just insane, the number of people who were picking it up and reprinting it and reaching out to me. And I ended up on TV, I was on the news talking about it. But nobody knew why I had written it. They thought, oh, you wrote this list because you'd mastered these things. Nobody knew that I had written it because I struggled with it. And so in the midst of all that, a literary agent had called and said, oh, you should write a book. And so I was thrilled to be able to write the book and then sort of be able to explain the backstory. It wasn't that I can claim I never do these things. It's that I too struggle and I'm working on them and trying to get rid of them in my own life. Wow, Amy, thank you so much for sharing. And I just want to say, I think you're like a warrior, you know, having gone through everything you've gone through and turned it around. Um, I kind of, I want to go back to um, when you, when you lost your mom, how did you, how did you approach that? Really? Were you, did you grieve? Did you just get right up right away? Was there some kind of disassociation going on? What was your your thought process at that time, if you could? Sure. It You know, it was a really strange place to be. So I was an adult. I was 23. But on the other hand, there were so many things I wanted to do. Uh, and I just I had always imagined that my mom would be there. And I was sad for my mom because she had always wanted to have grandkids and she'd had plans to retire and she was so close to having all of these things in life. And she'd put off a lot of things. She sat, like a lot of moms, she'd sacrificed for her family. And so it was finally, you know, my sister and I were finally through college and she was finally getting a new kitchen and she didn't get to see it to completion. And so I was sad about so many things that, you know, she had done for us and that she wasn't able to do. And then I was sad for my dad. They'd been married since my mom was 18 and my dad was 19. And so he'd never really been alone in his adult life. And I just thought, you know, now what do I do? So for a long time, it was a matter of saying, how do I take care of myself? And how do I help my dad? And how do we pull together now as a family and make sure that, you know, we're all supporting each other through this? And um, it was just a couple weeks after my mom had passed away. It was uh, this. I had taken two weeks off from work because to be a therapist, I was like, I can't do this while I'm still in the midst of being really sad. Um, but right after I returned to work, my my parents' house had caught on fire, and all of my mom's stuff was ruined with smoke and water damage. The house didn't burn flat or anything, but by the time the firefighters come in and fix put the flames out, there's so much water and smoke damage and I thought well now now all my mom's stuff is ruined and uh you know it was a dark place for a long time I just I felt physically ill I felt emotionally drained but I knew as a therapist I knew that the painful part of grieving is the process by which you heal and I really had to go through it you know our tendency is to try to distract ourselves or ignore it or cheer ourselves up and other people are really uncomfortable when you're sad so sometimes you know friends and family who are all well-meaning and wonderful people would try to you know make jokes and try to cheer me up and that was helpful sometimes but it's hard to just sit with somebody when they're sad and so it was I was fortunate as a therapist. I had a lot of therapist friends who um, really were helpful. And, and, uh, you know, I guess it was just the love of other people that really helped me get through it. And the, the wonderful memories that I had with my mom made it easier to know that um, even though she was only here for 23 of my years, we'd had a great um, relationship. And so that was certainly made it easier, I think, than for people who have complicated relationships with somebody who's passed away that adds another whole level to it. So I guess it was just a matter of allowing myself to be sad and knowing that, um, that the, the grief would, um, help me heal eventually. Hmm. 
Thanks for sharing. And when you were writing down this list of what mentally strong people don't do, what what was your reasoning? What was your thought process behind the the negation of the they don't do? Why wouldn't you just write, um, you know, they do this, they do that, they do this? Why did you decide to say, oh, they don't do this? Yeah, that's one of the most uh, popular questions. People always say, why on earth would you write write a book about what not to do? And it just boiled down to, I'm a fan of saying, let's work smarter and not necessarily harder. Mm -hmm. And as a therapist, I had realized if you know, they taught us as therapists to really build on people's strengths. When they come into your office, figure out what they're already doing well and help them build on that. But it occurred to me, you know, if I wanted to go to, say, a physical trainer to become physically fit, and they told me to work out and run on the treadmill, that'd be great. But if they didn't tell me to quit eating so many donuts, I'd be really upset. <laughs> um, because, you know, maybe I'd even reward myself. Hey, you ran an hour on a treadmill, go eat six donuts. And, and nobody would tell me, hey, by the way, it's those things that also are making your hard work uh, not very fruitful. And so I figured out, you know, sometimes again, it just takes one or two bad mental habits that outweigh all of your good habits. So it was about giving up those little things. And so for me, it was about saying, how do I not do these certain things that would keep me stuck and that uh, would prevent me from moving forward? And I, it was things I'd recognized over the years. I'd just never written them all down in one place until that day I, I wrote the list. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense now, and that's it's very powerful, and it's probably why so many people wanted to see it for sure. Um, so, you know, the the book is uh, is wonderful, and I noticed that one of the things that you touch on first is not spending your time doing things on what you to recognize that there's a big difference between just being sad and feeling sorry for yourself. Being sad might be thinking, "Gosh, you know, this is difficult." called this is really hard whereas self pity is when you start the films are bigger than everybody else's nobody understands what i'm going through there's no possible solution and that's when we start to just dwell on how bad we feel how horrible it is and we start to become hopeless and helpless and that's what makes us stay stuck and even when you can't fix a situation if you have a loved one with a health problem yeah you can't fix it but you can still choose to do something that would make your life or somebody else's life a little bit better you don't have to just sit around and dwell on how awful horrible and terrible life is yeah yeah for sure i mean it's to me i kind of think about it as like how much better would your life be if you were just trying to not make it worse? Like just on your yes. end, like if you were just trying to not make it worse, you know, no matter what your situation is, there's always some amount, there's always some level of opportunity of things you can or choose not to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, to me, I think, I think this, this in, in specific is really accentuated because you know, the, the average person is just like mindly scrolling through Instagram, seeing like this highlight reel of people's lives, like seeing this person went on a vacation, you know, this person has a loving mom, this person has that. And I think our first natural instinctual response is to compare yourself and be like, wow, you know, why, why am I here? Why am I there? And I think the reality is, is that it's just a highlight reel. You know, not no one's life is like that whatsoever. And I think it's just about understanding that. And I think, you know, social media and how we deal with each other online, specifically now, because everyone has a phone and it's just so it's just so mundane, it's so widespread. It can just be such an easy escape to to do. Yeah, absolutely. And studies will show that, that um, Facebook and Instagram for the vast majority of us are not good for our mental health. Um, primarily for that reason, you know, two reasons, really. The first one is it's called social media, but we know that it's not making us more socially connected with people. It has the opposite effect. But then the other reason is just what you say, that we compare ourselves, that you look at what your friends are doing and they're going on fun vacations or they're eating out at a fancy restaurant and you're sitting at home in your pajamas eating a TV dinner and you're thinking, you know, this isn't, how come my life can't be like that? And the more that we think like that, it's sort of the, the more stuck that we get and the harder it is because uh, every time you're 
wasting time and energy looking at what other people are doing you quit making your own life better but for it just becomes such a such a black hole i think to, to keep getting on social media and scrolling through and then thinking oh my life isn't as good and it wastes so much time and then you do it again and i mean studies will show the average person checks their phone a hundred times an hour i mean that's insane that you just keep picking it up and, and looking and mindlessly s sort of scrolling through and uh, so i think it's important to be aware of that and how it affects your thinking how it affects your behavior and how it affects you how you feel about yourself yeah and what i'm going to say kind of touches on your next point about not giving away your power but the way that i try to use social media is i try to use it i don't let it use me and yes you know i've i've been using social media to connect with amazing people such as yourself you know if social media didn't exist you and i wouldn't be talking and the people that were that are listening now to this podcast wouldn't have have listened to your wonderful story and and voice so i think you know just uh just realigning yourself and i think just like in a in a broader um range i think like this whole technology thing specifically with social media it's just coming so fast there aren't um, practices that have been nailed down and say hey you know you shouldn't check your phone first thing in the morning or you shouldn't check your phone or this or you should carve out um, tech-free zones in your house and tech-free hours. Um, that's what I do at least. And I think that's helped me regain a lot of my own power. And, and if anything, it's made me totally, you know, very grateful towards social media and let me really, really use it for good, I think. Yeah, I think it's like anything that, you know, because I'm not against social media. You're right. My article wouldn't have gone viral. I wouldn't be where I am right now had it not been for social media. And and I use it too. I use it a lot for my business. But I think um, it's just like anything, whether it's money, whether it's food, that things can have power over you. And uh, it's important to say, I'm not going to let social media run my life. I'm going to run my social media accounts. And as long as you can stay in control of that and that you're aware of it, because it does become, for so many of us, such a habit that people are, the first thing they reach for is their phone. The last thing they do before they go to bed is scroll through their phone. And you see people in restaurants scrolling through their phone at the table. So it's just really important to say, you know, how much of a role do I want it to play in my life and to make sure that you're taking charge of that. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I think a really big factor is when I'm on, because I use social media for business all the time and the podcast. And for me, it's like, people always want things from me. And when I check it in the morning, I'm like not giving time for myself to get ready for the day. I'm right. Right. I'm like, I'm just like, I'm like succumbing on a whim to, to other people. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I do that all day, but it's just like in the morning, that first hour, you know, I could be doing something like meditating, journaling, doing some, you know, productive things that will better me for the rest of the day. And then at the very end of the day, you know, to make sure I go to sleep saying I don't, you know, check the phone. And I think, I think that's just uh, for me that one hour before and uh, one hour at night is just uh, my key thing. For sure, I check my phone way too often throughout the day. Mm -hmm. and it's something that uh, that I, I, I need to adjust a little bit more. I, I took one of those um, those vacations and left my phone uh, for like a week, didn't touch it, and it was a complete game changer. Like it just felt like it just reset me. And I think. Yeah. I think a lot of us are just so, you know, our lives are just so boom, 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 boom. I got this meeting. I got this, got this, got this. It doesn't even become part of our conscious awareness. And it's just this extension. And the next thing you know, you're on like the Facebook feed for hours. And just like you said, there's studies to show if you use it in a certain way, it negatively affects mental health. And those that already have mental health conditions exacerbates it a lot. Yes. Leads up to isolation, which I think we, we talked a little bit about. And I think, yeah, I think, I think people just need uh, a core aspect of mindfulness to kind of negate the 24 seven social media landscape world. I think so too. And studies will show just giving yourself just as you say, a digital detox can be really good to, to for your brain and for your body and to just, to just remember that not that many years ago, we lived without phones. And, uh, and now we've become so dependent on them. So to just remind yourself of, okay, I can live without it. It's not um, something I need 24 seven. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Amy, I want to get on to uh, your your next book here. But for for the people that 
have gone through a, uh, a bad event, tragic event, um, what, what would be your, your advice to them? I know you have the list of 13 things not to do, but what would be your overall advice to people that are going through some really hard times or just feels like the, the sky is just falling down on them? You know, I guess uh, to know that you're stronger than you think you are, your brain will underestimate you a lot of times and tell you you can't do it, you can't stand it, you'll never make it, um, but that a lot of what you think isn't true mm. and that it isn't a sign of weakness to ask for help. Uh, one of the biggest battles I've fought in talking about mental strength is that people confuse being strong with acting tough and saying this doesn't bother me, I'm not hurt, I don't need any help is about acting tough and it's not being strong. Being strong is about saying, yeah, this is painful uh, and I'm having difficulties. And it might mean asking for help from either friends or family, or it might be asking help from a professional and saying, I need to talk to my doctor. I need to speak to my therapist because that's scary. It takes bravery and courage to, to take that step and admit that you don't have all the answers. So um, I always encourage people, if you're struggling with something, don't wait. Sometimes people will wait. Uh, I think the average statistic is when people are struggling with anxiety, they wait 10 years to ask for help. And that's 10 years that went by that they um, might have experienced a lot of unnecessary suffering. So go ahead and reach out for help now if you're questioning it. Yeah, absolutely. So Amy, your your next book, um, debatably, I want to say this is better than the, than the last one, but 13 <laughs> things mentally strong parents don't do. So why did you decide to go about writing this book just on parenting? This one was really uh, sparked by readers. Readers of my first book kept, mm -hmm. I kept getting the same question over and over and they kept saying, how do we teach kids how to be mentally strong? And I had spent a lot of my career as a therapist working with kids and working with parents and I was a foster parent myself and I know the importance of teaching mental strength at a young age. I had so many adult clients who would walk into my office and say, if I would have learned this 30 years ago, my life would have been completely different. And so I was really excited that so many people wanted to teach kids because you can start teaching this when kids are four years old. And uh, so I approached my publisher and I said, what do you think? And they were completely on board. And, um, you know, I could have written a book for, say, 10-year-olds, but I don't know too many 10-year-olds that could read the book and then put it into practice. And so I really wanted to teach parents, how do you become a mental strength coach? How can you learn these skills and learn the exercises that you can do for yourself, but also the exercises you can do for your kids and that you can do together? And as a family, I think we put so much emphasis on physical health and physical strength and we teach kids take care of your body and we take them to the dentist to take care of their teeth and yet most of us don't spend any time telling them how do you take care of your minds so i was so excited to be able to to put this book out there yeah which is debatably more important than physical and dental health right um, and i think this you know i i recently had somebody on the podcast that talked to me about parenting i just think parenting is such such a huge frontier because you know oftentimes parenting is one of the biggest aspects that the kid has in their life and they go through these things um, and it ends up impacting them whether it's some sort of trauma or something that did or didn't happen and a lot of that i think can go back to parenting so i'm, I'm really glad you you decided to read this book you know because i i don't you're not just affecting the parents like you said but you're also impacting the the next generation which is super, super, super important. Right, and I find that to be so exciting. And the feedback I've gotten from so many parents who say, you know, even though this exercise was for a kid, I never knew it myself and I'm learning it for the first time. And so I have, there's people out there who have master's degrees, they're successful in their careers, they're really doing well in, lo in life, and yet they're doing the emotional exercises that, you know, are built for four to eight-year-olds because they say, I had no idea. So I think for people to know it's never too late, you can learn it at any age, but the younger we start teaching people how to do this stuff, the better off they're going to be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, this this is awesome. So if I'm a, if I'm a dad um, and I you know recently have a newborn and uh, I'm like just trying to train myself right now you know I'm not in in direct contact. What would you tell me are some of the few first things that I should focus on to try to train myself? 
So I think, you know, for uh, as a parent, it's just really important to say what kind of role does mental strength play in my own life? Kids will learn much more from from what you do rather than what you say. And so when you have an infant, you can just start saying here, here are the things I'm going to do and start putting them into practice in your own life right now. So that by the time your child is old enough to start learning mental strength exercises, when they're two and three and they're throwing temper tantrums and that sort of a thing, the way that you respond makes a big difference. You want to be able to teach your child that it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to, to kick someone. It's not okay to scream in the middle of the grocery store. And so the, sooner you start arming yourself with as much knowledge and skills and tools and exercises as you can, the better prepared you'll feel, the more confident you'll be as a parent to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Here's how I turn this mistake or this problem into a teachable moment. Here's how I'm going to teach my child life lessons. And I think to know what are your values as a parent, you can do that even before you become a parent to know what, what, what are your values? What's most important in life? And I have a chapter in the book about values because we know that when they ask parents questions like, like, would you rather have your child be the smartest kid in the class or the nicest kid in the class? The vast majority of parents say, I want my kids to be the, I want my child to be the uh, nicest kid. Yet when they ask kids, what would your parents rather have the teacher say about you? The vast majority of kids say my, my parents would want me to be the smartest kid in the class. So I just, those little things to know what are my values and then am I actually teaching those values that I think that I'm teaching? Because when it comes down to that question, we spend so much time talking about homework and getting good grades or going to college. Well, how much time do you spend talking about being nice and being a kind and generous person? And so I think to just really be set on, okay, here's my values and here's what I want to teach my kids and this is how I'm going to teach them. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree with you. Um, and you you have a really interesting chapter in this book. It's they don't confuse discipline with punishment. Could you dive a little bit more into that and what you meant by that? Sure. So it's really important to give kids consequences when they misbehave because that's what teaches them a lesson. But I think sometimes we because we're embarrassed or we're ashamed, like I can't believe my kid did that, or I got called into the school for a meeting and that's terrible and that reflects poorly on me as a parent, that we sort of panic and we uh, punish our kids, which is when instead of teaching them, giving them a consequence that teaches them to do better, we start giving them consequences that are meant to make them suffer. And whether it's something embarrassing, we try to embarrass them on purpose, or we do something that makes them feel bad about who they are, not just what they did. And I'll talk to a lot of parents in my therapy office who are like thinking when I start talking about this, oh, you're one of those new age people, or it's okay for my kid to feel bad about himself. But when you think about it, let's say fast forward a few years and your child is offered uh, an opportunity to, to smoke or to do drugs with friends. Which child's going to say no to that? The one who's always felt bad about who he is or the, the one who has confidence and who's able to say, that's not a good choice. I don't want to do that. Um, we know that we need kids who, who aren't broken, who, kids who know, okay, I'm, I'm still smart. I'm still a good person. I can still make good choices, even though I mess up sometimes, to be able to take a stand and say no to those bad choices later in life. So I think it's really important to take a look at um you know, what rules we set for kids and then how we give them consequences so that we can help them make better choices in the future when we're not there to tell them what to do. Yeah. And you, I, you touched on a really critical point and I've seen this theme a lot, a lot, and I've discussed this with other people in this field. I think parents are just really caught up in their own self-esteem, right? And I think that's from every age, whether you have a three-year-old and they're crying and you're so focused on how embarrassed you are because your right. kid is crying or like in the supermarket and your kid's screaming, your kid's throwing things off and like you resort to physical punishment. You resort to something bad or like, oh, I'm not going to you know, do this or that. And, and then I think it even goes up to, to older kids, right? Like I think um, a lot of kids in high school, right? A lot of parents want them to go to like this super prestigious college is so they can kind of tell their own friends when their kids are off in college, oh, my, you know, Johnny's in Stanford University and he's like doing all this stuff. And I think it's, I think to me, it's just like you said, kids won't do 
as you say, they'll do as you do. And just like you said, mm -hmm. instilling those values in yourself and then your kid being able to see those and you kind of taking responsibility for yourself, your kid will, um, you know, for sure end up with those same values. And for all the parents out there, you should definitely read this book without <laughs> a doubt. You know, and thank you for saying that. Parenting is tough, you know, and I, I, I cut parents lots of slack because it didn't used to be that we lived in the world of helicopter parents. You know, 20 years ago, if somebody forgot their soccer cleats, that was okay. You just didn't get to, to practice that day. Or if you forgot your math homework, uh, maybe you'd get a zero, but it wasn't a big deal because other kids forgot their homework sometimes. But now we live in a world where 95% of parents are rescuing kids from that stuff. And they're, instead of acting like a... Um, supportive parent who lets their kid make mistakes they're acting more like their kid's personal assistant they don't they're running stuff around they're helping kids with their homework they're doing their projects for them and really propping kids up because they want them to look really successful in high school and sadly it sets them up for failure later in life that kids need to know how to fail they need to know how to make mistakes they need to know that it's okay you can be uh, resilient or if you fail a test it's not the end of the world but it's harder to do that i think than ever to let kids make those mistakes because you don't want your kid to be the only one who who doesn't get to do something or the only one who misses out in life because you were the only parent in the class who didn't rescue him wow i have never even thought about it that way wow <laughs> thank you for the insight <laughs> amy um amy so before I ask you where these people can find you online and connect with you, I just want to say this show is called Humans 2.0. And Amy, without a doubt, you're a human 2.0. And I think just listening to your story and then seeing how you've translated your journey into a tangible piece of value that other people can then read all over the world and embrace and through your TED talk and through you going on podcasts. I think you're really changing this world for the better. So Amy, where can people go online to check out your work and uh, and what you're doing? Uh, my website is Amy Morin, LCSW as in licensed clinical social worker dot com or you can just Google Amy Moore. And the great part about having a viral article is if you just Google my name, I'll come up somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Everyone, thank you so much for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Metry. And Amy, again, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.